How you guys doing? We're talking about the Daytona weekend in this one here. Now, I'm not going to talk about the Milwaukee truck race in this video, and I'm not going to talk about the F1 race this weekend, unless I'm just an absolute baboon and have confused the F1 weekends. But I'm pretty sure, yeah, they race this weekend. Um, so there's four slates this weekend. The Xfinity and Cup Series races on Friday and Saturday are my primary focus, okay? Going back through the years, this, I mean, these races specifically, but this weekend specifically has been pretty, not even exaggerating here, these previous Daytona races, or second Daytona races, have been pretty life-changing for me. Um, this has been pretty much my most important weekend of any NASCAR season. So for me, the focus is completely on the the races this weekend. And um, when I go ahead and look at this race, let me go ahead and move this. Um, I have made, and I've mentioned this before, but I have made this playlist um, breaking down how I analyze drivers, breaking down how I build lines specifically for this stuff. Now, usually I get, you know, some sort of imposter syndrome when I, you know, still hop up on here even to this day. But the fact that I have won several of the sp super speedway races, uh, like big, big contest for still haven't done it for cup, still have not done it for cup. Although I think I won a small 15, uh, in 2022, I haven't taken down the big cup one, but I've won several of the, uh, of the two lower series ones. And so most of the questions that I'll, that have been asked or whatever have been answered in this. I mean, this is almost like a seven hour, you know, playlist of how I approach stuff. And so if I don't answer something here, or if you guys don't like what I'm saying here, I would implore you to, uh, watch this, this playlist. And specifically this video is kind of going to be more so this type of analy analy analyzation of how dr how drivers are and like more of a film study on how each driver approaches them and i'm more so wanting to focus on this because uh you know sheets has been making more videos about him making lineups and then he posts them you know as they go live i used to do that on my own channel when i you know when, when everything was funded through patreon i would do patreon only videos that were just that was just like that so i'd show people how i build them and what the exact lines i would run and stuff and the one uh type of lineups that i never recorded on that were the plate racing lineup specifically like for cup i mean even like expanded because typically they would qualify the day before if it's like daytona or whatever and there's several hours you know between the end of q and the start of the race and i really couldn't record those because my process is literally just you know i turn on like some vietnamese like house music stuff from like 145 to like 130 beats per minute and then just like go in and build and build lineups i'll get up and walk around the apartment and uh and like come back and build and typically i like to build kind of in like different time groups of like do because i handle everything for these races not just you know the entire season that i do but like these specific ones that i've won with and it's you know i go and hand build stuff and um usually it's it, it's more of a sporadic type of, of build to where like i go in build lineups and i get up and walk around listen to stuff listen to music come back build lineups. i think the field will build so i know what they look like remove those and continue to go through i mean it's a long long process and stuff and as i've said this video is the or this playlist rather is is probably more so uh answering a lot of that stuff if you guys have not listened to it already uh mainly because i'm not going to go over you know seven hours of content uh just for you know another daytona uh, video but what i want to do here is go through the field and just like straight from my head talk about how i view everybody now we do have sc sh scattered sh storms in in the forecast for daytona this weekend um real chance both races are impacted by weather in some form or fashion, possibly racing on Sunday, possibly racing on Monday. Um, yet again, it's Tuesday, you know, three o'clock on a Tuesday. Uh, I can't, I don't know what the weather is. I'm not, God, I'm not in charge of that type of stuff. But that is, I mean, I don't need to be a genius to know that there's scattered th storms in the air. Um, so if Q is rained out for either one of these races, we're coming off at two races at Michigan to where we're probably going to have some good drivers in the back and a chance that we have the bad drivers starting in the middle of the pack. 
Okay, and, and yet again, you know, caveats and, you know, prerequisites of, you know, please watch this so I'm not, like, having to repeat or anything. But I only build for races that have wrecks in them. If the race goes green, I'm not going to make any money. If the race ends under rain, I'm not going to make any money. If the guys in the back wreck early, I'm not going to make any money. I understand my outs and I understand what happens if those don't happen. Uh, like, I'm, I'm fully accept, accepting that type of stuff. Now, clearly, it's not going to be the starting grid. Uh, the algorithm breaks in the uh, fastest lap, uh, average running position, I'm not mistaken, and finishing position. But still, we're going to see, you know, quite a few big names, I'm assuming, probably start towards the back of the field. Probably not like 35th, but like Christopher Bell would probably be like starting like 27th. Larson will probably be starting like 25th or something like that, uh, if not a little bit farther back. But we can see, you know, and, and we have a good idea of, or we have an idea at least of some of the drivers who will be starting the back of these, of these races. Same thing in this one here we're going to have, which I don't mind this nearly as much as the Xfinity because you're going to have at least junior, you're going to have a junior motorsports, most likely an RCR, I mean, pretty big names at least starting the back half of the field, at least from like 15th on back of Jesse Love, Cole Custer, um, Jones, Mayer, Herps, that's perfectly fine. We can very easily um, get different and not play them, and I think it can, I think for Xfinity, I might actually prefer that. Uh, ownership should be pretty centralized around uh, certain drivers. Yet again, this is not in the starting grid. These are just getting an idea of who would be back there once they get the algorithm out, which comes out tomorrow, and that's just the uh, the order of, of qualifying if, if things get ran, if things get rained out. Um, oops. When we look at the Xfinity series stuff, now Gustine is going to be in the 15 for this, and so this is what I mean by what I'm doing in this video. Um, by how I approach it, and very similar to the um, kind of film study of how people want to race. When I build lineups, and when I look at how people run specifically, there's multiple things that I'm wanting to either A, not see from drivers, or B, see from drivers. And so what I don't want to see is people who want to run up front, who have more balls than brain, who are being overly aggressive, and et cetera, et cetera. And now, as I go through this list, I'm going to just go through how I view each of those drivers and the risks that they have involved. This is on top of before we even get the starting grid, on top of before we even have the ownership or projected ownership, which is usually pretty easy to do on these types of tracks. This is just where people are. So when I look at Cole Custer, and this is not, you know, good or bad, this is, and this is not, as I said, it's not good or bad, it's just me speaking out loud Possibly, maybe this is providing more help. Maybe it doesn't, but this is how I view everybody. Cole Custer, going to run up front, very risky. Well, the reason why this is risky is because we are seeing, one, you know, the wrecks are going, or wrecks in this in these races are going higher and higher, uh, or the wreck percentage in, in races. When we used to race, or when we used to, um, like, you know, if you just go back, you know, a couple years and stuff, and um, when we go back, let me, there we go. Like, when we go back several years, uh, let me just borrow paint.net really fast, and uh, when we go back several years, and you look back at the, you know, the, the true talent level and, the, and, and the, uh, the actual skill level between drivers, the, this is not DNF or win, this is the uh, drastic change in skill level and s true talent between each of the drivers in the field, and so you would have, like, you know, kind of extreme on this end, but you'd have like Junior in the Xfinity series, you'd have Justin Allgaier, you'd have a Stewart in the field, you'd have uh, a Haley, an AJ Allmendinger, et cetera, et cetera, and then you'd be balanced out by like true, just absolute trash teams, Mike Harmon teams, uh, drivers who just have no skill, and so on and so forth, and so there was a big disconnect between good drivers and bad, like the, the skill level was very much peaks and valleys in the uh, Xfinity series and even in the truck series and the cup series. Now, since we have less practice, less testing, truly take a step back and ask yourself, this is why, you know, going back, I like speed. I like racing cars as fast as we can. We have lost the two remaining intermediate style two mile racetracks. We just have Michigan left. That is the only place on the planet you can go in a circle at like 190 180 in a car. Truly, that's it. Atlanta Super Speedway, Daytona Super Speedway, and Talladega. I mean, that's drastically different. The last true fast racetrack on earth is Michigan. We've lost Auto Club. We lost Texas World. So, 
We have like Michigan by itself. We're not using this in the data. I'm just talking out loud. We have Michigan by itself. We have some intermediate tracks that we go to, you know, pretty much like once a year now. We're, you know, Chicago Land's just sitting in the middle of nowhere abandoned. Kentucky is just sitting abandoned. We're losing 1.5s, okay? So we have less tracks that are giving drivers or even random people, whether you have money or not, you want to NASCAR experience, you want to go ARCA racing, whatever, you're losing tracks where you are able to go fast at. And it's very unlikely we will ever build more racetracks like that, like Michigan, like Texas World, like Auto Club. That'll just never happen. Nobody's going to approve that. No one would, no one would, no, no, you know, no county, no city would, would, would undertake that type of uh, development and stuff. And so when we look at the lower series and these drivers, you're losing the testing, the possible experience, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, if you are just brand new to this type of stuff, your only testing pretty much is ARCA practice during the off season and the ARCA race, okay? If you're growing up or getting pushed through the system, those are your only two practice sessions, okay? If you're not in that, you get one practice session a year for Xfinity, one practice session a year for truck at Daytona start of the year, past that it's just qualification and it's just racing okay and so your time of actually understanding what the car is going to do and learning skills and learning how to drive in these conditions are getting fewer and fewer okay and so as i said that skill level that we saw you know drastic peaks and valleys that has now been reduced in my opinion to where the ceiling has been capped and the bottom of the floor whether it's the bottom of the floor has been raised, which I don't think so. I think the ceiling has just come closer down to the bottom to where we no longer have, you know, good drivers and bad drivers in the field. We now have a pretty even, you know, more more so like an even distribution of, of skill within these fields and what, what drivers have. And what that means more of is, uh, well, let's save that, is when we're looking at these drivers here, okay, we see drivers that have less and less experience. We see drivers who have been around longer. Cole Custer, Allgaier, um, Austin Hill, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Like some of these guys who have been around longer, like Riley Herbst, you can argue that he's a, you know, he's a true veteran. He's a real trucker, uh, you know, served his country here on these plate races. And like that is the upper echelon. That is the upper peak of skill level between these guys. And so when we're looking at guys who run up front, we're seeing that cautions are specifically happening more. Now, we're still having guys get stupid in the back, wrecking for last, whatever. That's always going to happen. But we're seeing a majority of the big accidents start up front, whether it's the lead pack or not lead pack, whether it's a lead car doing a bad block, blocking late, or somebody just getting, trying to make a move that doesn't happen from like third to seventh, collecting people in crashes pretty much from fourth and fifth to the early teens in in these in these fields and so if you have drivers racing up front they are at a much higher chance to be involved in wrecks than they ever should now you might argue that like brandon you know dale jr says you know the these cup drivers say it, it it's hard to make up positions you can't ride in the back no more to make it through here and that is true real real life it's very hard to get from 29th with 10 to go to second okay but fantasy aspect wise I would argue it's probably even more viable now than it has been. We'll talk about the cup in a second. But when we look at the cup or when we look at the Xfinity series, I see a lot of red flags around people who want to race up front. And so like that is Cole Custer, Sam Mayer, cars that are either good and fast, teams that, you know, by default are going to have fantastic speed in terms of cars and or guys who are just driving beyond their freaking limit of like, what are you doing? So like that you're going to go through here and I'm going to go through here and it's going to sound like I hate a majority of the field and it's because I do. It then goes to where they're starting or how, you know, what their upside is or what cars are in. But like Cole Custer, Sam Mayer, Jesse Love going to be up front. Anthony Alfredo going to race above his head, try and be in the top seven all day. All guy is going to be up there. So like, we already have a lot of risk around these guys here because they want to preoccupy or they want to be in the top 10. Same thing with Justin Allgaier, same thing with Sammy Smith, Jones, same situation. We start getting to people like Josh, or as I just go through, like Josh Williams, much more conservative than the previous guys we mentioned. And when I say, you know, when I build lineups and I listen to music and stuff, like I am thinking of how 
this race is going to play out and where people are going to run and stuff. That is what my main thing is trying to do. That's why I fully believe if you're using an optimizer, if you're using SaberSim, like SaberSim is a great tool, not throwing shade that way. But when we get to situations like this, I implore you to hand build. You will be far, far more... Um, far more plus EV than having any optimizer, you know, build your lineups on some arbitrary metric that truly gets thrown out the window when we get to races like this that can turn to plate races and or turn into turn into crash fest and stuff. So like when I see Josh Williams and yet again this is just top of my head of, of how I watch stuff. And secondly, if you know how I watch things on my own channel, like I have you know, the, the fun meme reactions, you know, 10 seconds to love that video. And stuff. But that's how I legit watch these races, okay? I, I go through, like, I shake like a leaf from here to, like, cue in the start of the, in the, start of the slate uh, with how much money I have on, on, these, on these slates. And then I just sweat and shake like a, like, a, you know, I just shake it and sweat like crazy hoping for crashes that don't involve my guys in these races, okay? And so what I'm trying to do when I'm building lineups and when I'm, you know, thinking of how this race goes through, I'm trying to understand who is up front, who's a detriment to my lineups, et cetera, et cetera. And at that point, you're looking at two different directions of one, finding guys who are on up front and finding guys who are accident prone or just prone to like plowing into wrecks and stuff. Okay. And so like Anthony Alfredo, accident prone, don't want to be really, really concerned with Anthony Alfredo, really concerned with like Sam Mayer, Cole Custer, they're up there. We get to Williams. Probably going to be much more conservative. I don't see him necessarily doing a ton of wild shit. But when you get to N, team stacks are pretty, pretty important here. So, like, Josh Williams on his own, not going to be insanely stupid, okay? But he is connected by the hip to AJ Allmendinger. So if AJ wants to ride, they're both going to ride. If AJ wants to race, stupid-ass Carly is going to go up there and race. Like, that's that situation. SVG, most likely going to ride. The first half of the race, just make it through. Good if he starts in the back. Uh, kind of scary and really not playable. Yet again, you know, in these races, I'm not playing anybody starting 12th up. Um, so, like, keep that in mind. But, like, SVG is kind of going to fall in line with whatever AJ wants to do. AJ is pretty much the the leader of how Colleague approaches this race. Okay? Uh, Gustine in the 15. I mean, my lord. Oh, man. Might be a more talented Caesar Basarella. But Gus Dean is a absolute weapon in these races. Okay, look back at his race in the truck series. Look at his ARCA races. This man is a bona fide wrecking ball. He is absolutely not going to lift at all. Okay, a lot of people fear him in the ARCA series. A lot of people give him a lot of crap because he's like trying to wreck people. He causes wrecks. He moves people out of the way. Um, and that has not translated nearly as well in the truck series. He's been involved in a lot of wrecks in the truck series because he has been so aggressive and he's wanting to be up front. In ARCA, it works out because the cars are so slow and people spread out and stuff. If he's getting stupid, you know, it's just him side by side with somebody else or moving somebody up the track or whatever. Big, big, big detriment to the 15 team this week at Daytona with Gustine behind the wheel. That is a big, big, big concern. Keep that in mind. Or at least understand. Like, if he, if Gu I talk shit, but if Gustine's starting... 31st, you better believe I'm going to have 30% of Gus Dean. I'm just well aware of what he's going to do. Very, very volatile with Gus Dean. Sheldon Creed's going to try to be up front all day. Joe Graff Jr. doesn't have a talent to be up front. Doesn't have a talent to be smartly right in the back. Probably going to run like 17th all day. Ryan Trix want to be up front. Austin Hill, big country Austin Hill in the RCR car. Going to want to lead. Uh, expectation is to start in the top five. If not, grab the pole again. Right around Jesse Love. Going to be up front all day. An absolute detriment to a DFS line. Jeffrey Earnhardt, the fake Earnhardt son, uh, blew a motor in the spring Talladega race this year. If that isn't the case, Jeffrey is most likely going to ride the first half and start pushing halfway into stage two, if not stage three. Um, also, secondly, Talladega, when it comes to rain, whether they typically don't race nearly as stupid. Daytona, I think the benefit of this being a rain short race, not that I'll build specifically for it, but I think if it is rain short and they do tend to get more stupid with the amount of talentless idiots in this race, um, just speaking out loud, Jeb Burton, Jordan Anderson, the, the big concern here, like Anderson in the 32, got to make sure he's got the Larry Mack crew chief again. Anderson's going to ride. 
Jeb is going to ride. Parker's most likely going to ride. I, I believe Jeb and, and Anderson will probably ride. Parker's kind of going to be on his own deal, but I, I, I envision the Jordan Anderson team to try and survive and get there at the end. Um, Joey Gay's, you know, AO and Joey Gay's going to be riding the back. Safe plays, fantastic plays with AO and, and, and Joey Gay's. Um, De Benedetto probably going to ride. We, we, we saw him get involved in some accidents earlier in the year. Uh, or even earlier, you know, in at Talladega and stuff earlier, but he's he's involved in wrecks that are happening in front of him. He's right in the back. I'm not really concerned about Matt Benedetto until later in the race. I think Sieg is going to want to race. Leland should ride. All the Alpha Beta Prime boys, I have no concern about them. They should be riding outside of Caesar. That man is a fucking wild man. When we look back, this is, this is where I'm hesitant, not hesitant, but I don't know how people build this stuff specifically. Side note, Michigan... Part of me really was tempted to build this like a plate race at Michigan. And it probably would have worked because you would have had a lot of guys in the high 40s and 50s. Don't know if you would have taken it down. You would have need uh, Nemechek and or Allgaier. No, Allgaier scored 77. You probably would have needed Allgaier. But a lot of guys in the 40s and 50s, DK wise, from the Michigan race. Now, first time ever I had, I was thinking about doing that outside of a plate race, and I ran into rider's block. The, the best way I can describe it is I ran, I ran to rider's block because I couldn't envision certain drivers finishing well, getting through the field, and I now I don't know if that's going to help me or not, but for the first time ever, I was able to possibly understand why there's such a disconnect and why it's so hard for people to click on bad drivers in the back of these races. I might understand it better now because I was very hesitant. I talked myself out of doing that on several drivers, Okay. Just want to point that out. Back to Caesar. When we look at Caesar, absolutely probably one of the worst drivers I have ever seen race on plate races. This guy is absolutely horrific. Alpha Beta Prime, absolutely. All balls, no brains from Caesar Bossarella. The guy is DNF like 18,000 times. Somehow, some way, coming off of three finishes. And three top 10 finishes, if I'm not mistaken. At least three top 20. Um including last week at Michigan. Now, let's talk Michigan really fast. What caused the flip at the end of the race? Okay, you might be like, Kligerman shoved Caesar, you know, just just pushed the crap out of him, causing the wreck. I would argue, no, if you can't hold your line, you can't take a bump, you shouldn't be in the series. You have no excuse. Uh, Caesar has no talent, got bumped from behind by Park Kligerman, started getting all squirrely, hit the wall, hit go, goes on the inside, knocks Sieg, uh, down the track and flips him over, and he finishes ninth here. That's what we expect from Caesar. Okay, he's gotten away with it three times in a row. You can look at my stuff. I've played Caesar in every single race outside of the races where he's starting in the top twenty. Um, so I know what it's like having him wreck. I know what it's like having him finish. And pretty much any time Caesar's finished well, I've I've won a shitload of money. Um, but Caesar coming off at of three finishes might get bumped in projections and or, you know, public sentiment, uh, public opinion, whatever. When we look at the alphabet of prime guys, Brennan Poole had a uh, oil pump failure at Michigan. Very rare to see the alphabet of prime cars run into mechanical failures. I'm usually never concerned about that. You know, it's just going to happen here and there. Not concerned about Ryan Ellison Poole. Caesar is his own man. Caesar will be up front in the top 12 at parts of the Daytona race on Friday night. It is just going to be dependent on if he's up there at the wrong or worst time. So keep that in mind. As we continue to go through, Parker Ligerman, I don't want to, I don't want anything to do with Parker Ligerman. Parker wants to run up front. He's so stupid. He's so dumb. I don't want anything to do with Parker Ligerman. He is one of those guys, overly aggressive, driving over his head. Don't want to see that at the... I just don't want to see that from people. Unless he's starting in the back of the field. And even if he is, I'm very much leaning to... Fading that type of chalk, I think Kligerman's a terrible play uh, just from a approach standpoint in these races. We're not looking at finishes. We're paying attention to how these guys run in these races, okay? Clements, unfortunately, been involved in a lot of wrecks recently, usually involved in wrecks when he's around mid-pack early in the races. Uh, I think that's been more so bad luck on Jeremy's part. He's typically able to survive through the race if he can survive the first part. He's just involved in a lot of first yellows, like, a lot, um, hopefully he'll ride. That's pretty much the only thing there. Uh, Joey Gay is going to ride. Don't know who's in the 74 this week. Uh, seems like great play. Doesn't matter who it is. It's Mark Harmon car. Hopefully, uh, hopefully everybody dies and he can just get through. 
Chandler Smith going to run up front. Josh Balicki going to ride pretty safe. Uh, Kyle Weatherman should ride slightly more aggressive than Balicki. We run into situations where like DGM used to be very correlated with each other. I feel like Kyle Weatherman's much more aggressive than, than Balicki. Balicki's going to ride. Weatherman might try and race. SVG, as I said, he's going to be with the other colleague cars and pretty much following the, the discretion of what AJ wants in this field. Harp's going to try and be up front with Cole Custer. SS Greenlight Racing guys should be fantastic plays, although CJ is just as bad as Caesar. Um, and those are like my mental notes, my vomit of just how I view all these drivers right off the bat. Um, I don't know if that helps you or not, but that's that, that's usually what's in my head as I'm like marching around listening to my, my techno and EDM music as I'm building lineups and stuff. This is just where my, my head goes with these guys. As we look at the Cup Series, and like I said, maybe this video will help, maybe it won't. I'm just kind of word vomiting all my, my, my brain juice out and uh, and just, you know, just talk about how I view these idiots. Um, when we look at the Cup Series, okay, it's going to be a lot easier to, to talk about the guys projected to ride in this race than the ones who aren't going to do that. The two Rick Ware cars, going to be great plays. Haley might try and be up front, but typically they ride in the back. We see the two RFK guys ride in the back. Really, outside of that, we got a lot of question marks. J- BJ McLeod, most likely going to start in the back in any situation, rain out or not. He's here to race. He led laps at Talladega. He knows what he's doing. Great plate racer. But if he's not concerned about the car, he's going to be racing up front. Okay? Big, 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 big concern about BJ McLeod racing up front. Okay, understanding what's going to happen. He's going to finish top five because he knows what he's doing or he's going to be involved in the crash. Very, very risky. Very, very risky BJ McLeod play. Parker Retzloff in the 62. Very, 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 very risky in this car. Big concern with what Parker is going to do. When it was gone in the 62, he would ride. Anybody else... Noah would run a run up there ever since the ever since Mr. Beard died and his wife has been in charge of the team. This team has been much more aggressive, whether it's Austin Hill, Noah Gregson, Anthony Alfredo, Parker Retzloff. Big concern about the 62 car racing in this field and not being able to make minor repairs to this car if there's damage if they break a left rear they are not going to be able to fix it this team does not have enough experience in the time frame to replace a broken toe link very concerned that any damage at all takes parker out of the race okay big concern there joey gaze in the 44 big concern the 44 team doesn't even bring a car that can race correctly probably gonna be a lap down probably gonna be several laps down but i'm not concerned about Joey Gaze, the Parker, and BJ McLeod are the big kind of question marks of how they're going to approach this. I don't have a feel on them at all. Well, I mean, those are my feels. I, like, I, I know BJ's going to race. Big concern there. I don't know what Parker's going to do. Probably going to be much more aggressive than he needs to. Hopefully he rides early, but if he doesn't, he doesn't. Whatever. Uh, Chastain. Don't see him riding. Don't see that being the case. Cindric, uh, null and void, probably going to be a mid-pack. Austin Dillon's going to ride. Barry's probably going to ride. Larson's going to be up front. Kozlowski's going to ride when it's smart. LaJoy used to be, you know, the spitting image of what we wanted at these plate races. He was optimal like 82,000 times in these events. And now, real chance that he just wants to go out there and race and race stupid. I'm concerned about LaJoy actually racing here. Uh, Kyle, don't really have a view. Don't really have an opinion. He's caught up in Rex regardless of where he's at. Elliot's going to be up front. I think Gregson's going to be mid-pack. Blaney's going to be up front. Mid-pack for Briscoe. Ware's going to ride. SVG's going to ride, at least in this one. He might be more aggressive on Saturday, but I think he's going to ride for Sunday. Busher's going to ride. Trick's going to ride. I think Bell's most likely going to be up front. Um, Burton's probably going to ride. Logano's going to be up front. Wallace up front. Byron up front. Hemrick, if and are there. Like, it, he pisses me off so much. He'll be up front way earlier than he should and he's been avoiding wrecks at a pretty good rate when they happen up front, but I, I am concerned about uh, Hemrick doing some wild and stupid shit in this race. I think Austin Hill races aggressively here because he's big country Austin Hill in the RCR machine. I think he's here to you know race up front. I don't think he's here to ride concern there. I think I would lean towards front row guys falling back if they don't see headway very early, but anything can happen there. Nemechek should ride. Eric Jones should ride. As I stated, 
Gay should Gay should be running dead last for a majority of the race, um, which is a good thing as long as he just doesn't, you know, retire from the race. Um, Reddick up front, Stenhouse up front, uh, Bowman up front, Haley going to ride. I think Gibbs is probably going to do whatever the other, what a majority of the Joe Gibbs guys are going to be running, so no real opinion there. Zane probably going to be back of the pack, if not mid-pack for a majority of it. Uh, same thing with Hosovar. I think Hosovar and Zane are probably going to ride, at least at the start. <clears throat> the Cup Series is much more aggressive. Like, if if Brad can keep them from saving fuel, it's going to be a much better race, okay? Uh, the only reason they're side-by-side side is because they're saving fuel. But if Brad does the same thing and forces people to run down and, and force them to pit instead of saving fuel, this opens the possibility of the Chevy guys being much more safer plays because they are absolutely horrific at the plate racing strategy. <clears throat> Typically the Fords and Toyotas are much more efficient during green, during green flag pit stops and getting out faster and taking the lead under green flag conditions at super speedways. And so for me, whenever we have the, 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 the Chevy guys pit early or try and stick together or whatever, they typically fall back and they're usually getting beat by the Fords when it's like truly, you know, strategy plays here. So that bumps the that bumps the Chevys up. If we're deep in the race, halfway through, et cetera, et cetera, and we're having to do green flag pit stops, I would actually prefer to have more Chevy drivers late in the race compared to the other two, especially the Spire cars, because I don't think they're going to be running up front in a situation like that. Like at this point, I'm talking out loud, race is 160. Say if we go the full distance, I'm talking like lap, like, 95, 98, you know, to, to, to 120, 130 during the last, like, green flag pit stop. Chevy should be at a disadvantage. Should be in the back of the field or have a greater chance if we're looking at the true Fords, Toyotas, and Chevys. The Chevys are fucking all over the place with their pit strategy. Hello, guys. We might get seven overtimes here, but nah, you know what? As soon as we get to our number 160... We're going to run the car out of fuel coming out of the coming out of turn four white flag. That is the Chevy mentality. So as soon as they're in their window, Chevy will probably short pit and like fuck themselves on fuel. If anything, that's probably a good thing for DFS. Um, keeps them in the back of the field, makes, you know, the Fords and guys get stupid up front. Of course, you're going to have your outliers like track house guys are probably going to be racing much smarter. But these are all the things I, I kind of consider and think of when I'm looking at um, these drivers here. Notice I didn't say anybody of like, oh, this is a good pick or a bad pick. I'm just speaking out loud of what these guys' tendencies are to drive and where they're at in certain situations. Yet again, combine that with where we're seeing wrecks in these races caused by front runners making bad blocks or big checkups or just accordion effects through the line, you know, and ends up taking the third, fourth, or fifth guy out in a line out and he comes back down the track and you start collecting people running from like eighth to 17th. Like that is the true danger zone. And it could be higher up front if they spin the leader or whatever. But, like, up front is, you know, I would argue the most dangerous spot nowadays in these races, okay? Yes, it's difficult to get through the field if you ride. You're not going to get from the back of the field and go up. But for DFS, if you start in the back of the field, you ride in the back of the field, and you fucking finish 11th at the end of the day, you're, you're a fantastic play. That's what I'm trying to chase here. Um, and so those are more so my thoughts on where these guys are at and and... And just or where these guys are at in terms of their skill level. And yet again, that kind of goes back to my like line graph of where these guys are at in terms of skill. It used to be much more distinct, know what they're doing, know not what they're doing. Now it's like, you know, less practice. Even I mean, even the cup guys, like you you don't have practice anymore. You don't get to feel what these cars do in the draft. You know, and then you get loose or you overcorrect or whatever. Like I we have seen the volatility start going higher and higher in situations and then i mean this this weekend is the most viata most uh vi i just went blank on the word most crazy scientific term crazy of the four plate race weekends of the cup series this is the weekend to where even when you break down daytona 500 weekend first talladega this daytona last talladega in terms of the amount of dnfs both races on this weekend this is the highest amount of carnage this is the traditional stack from the back weekend in general on top of just what i normally do this is the most important weekend of my of my year pretty much every year um and so that those are my opinions on on all these guys i'm mainly trying to focus on where everybody will be running in the race so like with my projections now we can kind of talk about how i use my own my own projections here because i will not play 
any of my highest projected lineups because I build my projected uh, or I build my projections so I can know who not to play. Okay, and that is not where I'm purposely, you know, like Cody Ware, for example. Uh, high likelihood he finishes in the top 20 of this race regardless of where he starts because he can just survive and he's not probably going to race at all. Um, but if he's starting 31st, I'm going to project him probably for 24th, 25th. Like he's going to get a you know an average projected finish of like 27th and stuff because if it's any higher, it'll like overvalue him and it'll be like an outlier in the um, projections for my, for my use here. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll go and project everybody through these races and I'll project the people who... I'll project everybody to finish where they should finish if carnage and wrecks don't happen. Now, that might seem counterintuitive or uh, contrary to how I'm approaching it, but that helps me determine who the more popular plays will be, what will be shown more in optimizers, and what specific combinations of drivers will most likely be put together by optimizers and different uh, sim results and stuff like that. Once I identify that type of stuff, I can then identify... Pretty easy projections. Now, the number doesn't matter for me. I'm just able to see where ownership will go in comparison to what people are projected for. So clearly people projected to be better plays will carry more ownership. And then the third part of that is then I can then remove all the guys who have high projected DraftKings points and high projected ownership and just play the shitty plays at the bottom of my projected, you know, points field and stuff. Who start in the back? Who start from like 12 on back? And that's how I go about uh, using projections for these races, and that has worked very, very well for me. Uh, but just as a heads up, that's how I use my own numbers on these uh, races here. Um, if I am going to at least, like, I I mean, I handled everything, but I'll throw everything in just to see where people are going and stuff. So that's how I use it to be aware of uh, of what um, these numbers or what what these people are projected for, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and really at that point, Stack from the back, boys. Six guys from the back. Five ones and six sixes. That's that's all you can play if you're chase. If you're playing anybody from twelfth on up, it's dead money. Absolutely horrific way to play. Um, don't play cash this weekend because cash is very optimized. Uh, cash is very aggressive or cash is very, very hard. Um, purely just play GPPs and just just build for a wreck fest. Absolutely just one hundred percent build for a wreck fest. And uh, you are going to have a much higher chance of, of, of not even tripling, quadrupling, or like, what are they even called? I don't even know what it's called after 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 four. Um, might be ignorant, but based on my stuff and how I look at it, I get about a 25% hit rate of losing everything. Roughly 33% hit rate of breaking even. Uh up and down, you know, losing 20% of my entry fees, gaining 20% of my entry fees, and then the rest of that, so what is that? That's 53%. The other 47%, typically I'm I, I'm making like 3x, 4x, if not higher, and competing to take down tournaments and stuff. And so, uh, yet again, shaking like a leaf, this is the most stressful week of the year for me. Uh, these are the two most stressful slates of the year for me. Um, and if, if, if they don't wreck or they don't go my way, I am like tilted for an absolute week after fact after after the race. Like I'm I'm so cranky to be around. It's so absolutely the uh, the most stressful week of of the year for me. So um, that's where that is. I'll see you live to you know shoot the shit and you know basically just say oh I'll play the low guys play the lone guys in the backfield. But I, but I'll see you guys Friday and I'll see you guys. Saturday, uh, Truck Series live show going to be right before they go live, whenever that is. Uh, at least it'll be after the F1 race. Uh, but as I said, F1 and Milwaukee is such a secondary focus for me this week. And if Friday and Saturday don't go well at all, I'm doing like one line of each of those because I'm going to be so pissed beyond belief. Um, but that's it. Maybe you didn't. Maybe I didn't say anything that you liked here. I got plenty of lineups and plenty of uh, plenty of plenty of videos talking about how I specifically make lineups, previous optimal lineups, with them visualized so you can see what they look like. Um, I mean, hours and hours of stuff. I think it's been like three or four takedowns. I haven't updated this. I still. I mean, just earlier this year, you know, had a twenty thousand dollar win in the Xfinity Series um, GPP. Uh, but I think just in here we have like three or four uh, takedowns just in this playlist alone um, of 
how I went about and, and, and built for them and stuff like that. So anyway, uh, it's Daytona week. I will see you guys in the live shows and I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to make it through (laughs) the longest 72 hours of my life. Like it's, you know, it's Tuesday right now. We just got to get to Friday and I got to slam lineups in for that race. Each race so far going to do 20 lineups in each. That's what I've always done right now. Plan specifically to do 20 in both $10 Xfinity Series contests, banking on the fact we get the first one filled, open up a second one, 20 in both of those, 20 in both the fours, looking to do 20 for the Cup Series, and the 15, four, five will be dependent on what happens Friday night, uh, two will be dependent on what happens Friday night, eight will be dependent on what happens Friday night, but that is the plan for my approach right now. Um, so that is, uh, that's where we're at. I'll see you guys in the live shows on Friday. Bye-bye.